part of the this form is part of the humanitarian and emergency logistics uh, emergency logistics innovation expo or helix 2021 which is an initiative of the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance on Disaster Management or AHA Center. So for today's session, Ilham have walked us through the housekeeping rules. So again, we'll be with appreciated if microphones are kept on def uh, kept on mute by default. And if you have any specific questions, uh, kindly kindly uh, click on the chat button, feel free to put them in the chat um, button or chat option, and then indicate to which speaker do you intend to ask your question. All unanswered questions will be forwarded to the speakers. So because we can't answer them all due to time constraints, and we'll endeavor to send the questions and their replies uh, to the participants through the email you used at the registration page. Now, as your panel host for this session, allow me to facilitate this discussion on the role of private sector networks in promoting multi-stakeholder humanitarian logistics action. So a while ago, for those who joined a bit earlier, you might have caught us chatting how this is, this is quite new, wherein you have the private sector being given a, a session to really discuss uh, their role in humanitarian logistics action. So we're really excited. In 2020, at a time when countries are actively responding to the pandemic and are implementing strict border controls, we saw Super Typhoon Goni and Vamco in the Philippines, which led to a great loss of lives and massive devastation of livelihoods and infrastructure in the northern and southern part of Luzon and even in the national capital region. Earlier this year in Indonesia, we have seen the flash floods and landslides in East Nusa Tenggara, which resulted to hundreds of lives lost and thousands of families displaced in the province. So emergency response to simultaneous events proved to be even more challenging in the context of limited workforce and resources and restricted mobility. So under the new ASEAN agreement for disaster management and emergency response or the ADMR and its work program for 2021, 2025, the role of the private sector has now been given more emphasis for enhanced collective response through standby arrangements and partnerships for new disaster scenarios. So acknowledging the critical role of private sector networks in emergency preparedness response and recovery, the Connecting Business Initiative continues to promote private sector expertise and capacity and how they work with national disaster management organizations or NDMOs, UN agencies, other private sector partners, and humanitarian and development actors. So really, it's, it's, it's for this reason that we are here today for this session with our expert panelists to talk about the important role of private sector networks in humanitarian logistics action. But we want to get to know you a little bit more through the Zoom activities, so which we will now launch. We have actually we have 257 participants registered for this session. We have a few on the line. So, uh, Ilhan, maybe we can already launch the Zoom poll to start the discussion. So let's start with poll number one, if you can launch it. So let's have the Zoom poll to help us profile the participants. So if we can launch a Zoom poll number one. Okay. So let's launch Zoom poll number one. There you go. All right, so participants tell us we're interested to know which organization or sector do you represent? Are you from the government, from the private sector, from um, non-government organizations or civil society, UN agencies or others that we haven't, um, or, or, or other industries or other sectors? So let's give it a few more seconds. 
so I see we have uh, a lot of participants from the government, a lot as well from private sector. Okay, all right. Uh huh. Okay, I don't see anyone from the UN. Okay, so let me just. All right. So let's share. Okay, so we have people from the government, from private sector, from civil society groups, others, there you go. Right, thank you. Here, so here, you can now see the uh, result of the poll uh, that we just launched. Now let's go to the next one. So thank you for uh, answering that question. Now, have you let us know if you have engaged the private sector when it comes to your work in disaster management so the choices are yes i've engaged individual companies yes i've engaged private sector networks or platforms no i i have a work with the private sector before if you're a private sector org so the question the framing now is more of whether i've been gay i've been engaged whether my individual company or our network has been engaged by the NDMO or by the UN in disaster management. Okay, so let's wait for a few more seconds. A few more seconds. Uh huh. So I can see that. Oh, interesting. Because the the answers are yes. I've engaged the private sector networks. Uh, I've engaged private sector networks or platforms. Let's share with you the results very promising. So it means that uh, aside from individual company engagement, that there has been work in terms of private sector networks, business associations being engaged in disaster management work. Now for let's go to the last poll. Which do you think are possible entry points? So we'd like to know. Which do you think are possible entry points for private sector engagement in humanitarian logistics? So you can select all that apply. So you can select whether is it about developing or co-developing humanitarian logistics metrics, how to measure effectiveness and efficiency of our activities, establishing cross-sector learning. So there are roughly literature that says that uh, private sector can be a great resource or learning laboratory when it comes to supply chain and logistics expertise or do you think that maybe we can look or we should look into strengthening partnerships and dialogues fostering dialogues on standby arrangements or focusing on developing clear protocols of engagement and standard operating procedures. Okay, so let's take a look at what our participants have shared. Trickling in answers. There you go. So we have people saying that maybe we can start first with capacity building. So through training activities, joint simulation exercises, so we have the government and the private sector and the UN and other humanitarian and development actors um, really fostering a, a, a collective, um, this, this, uh, this collective knowledge management and capacity building expertise when it comes to humanitarian logistics. Thank you, great. So thank you for sharing with us your thoughts. And to formally start our discussion, let me now call on our panelists one by one. So as part of the introductions, I will ask each panelist to share what their organizations do and share their reflections on key lessons and the key lessons and the challenges or insights on when it comes to private sector engagement in humanitarian logistics. So let me introduce 
our panelists. Our first panelist is Veronica Gabaldon, who is the executive director of the CBI Network in the Philippines, the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation. And as the executive director of PDRF, Veron leads the strategic direction, programs, and administration of the organization towards achieving PDRF's vision to build resilient businesses and communities in the country. She also led the launch of the country's only or one of the first business uh, business led emergency operations center in Clark Pampanga. So Veron, tell us what PDRF does and share with us your insights on the multiple, the simultaneous emergencies plus COVID that you have experienced in the previous year. Colleagues, please welcome Veron of PDRF. Over to you, Veron. Thank you. Thank you, Riza, and good afternoon to every one of you. Thank you for inviting us here. Our organization, the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation, is a nonprofit organization in the private sector focused on disaster risk reduction management. We are a network of businesses with a unifying vision to build the disaster resilience of communities and businesses. We organize our member companies according to their core competencies and build an ecosystem toward disaster resilience, which no single organization can build on its own. PDRF operates a private sector-run emergency operations center. It is a platform for coordinating and harmonizing private sector efforts in response. In October of last year, Super Typhoon Boni, the world's strongest tropical cyclone in 2020, made landfalls across Bicol and Calabarzon regions, affecting over 2 million people and left serious damage to region's infrastructure and agriculture. Two weeks later, another typhoon, Vamco, dev devastated many areas in Luzon, including Metro Manila and Bicol, which were at that time still reeling from Super Typhoon Goni and caused massive flooding in Cagayan Valley. PDRF activated its emergency operations center and began communicating vital information to its private sector network to initiate disaster response and provide immediate needs to affected communities. PDRF mobilized the network's resources and delivered aid to the affected communities, consisting of four tons of food and non-food items, including PPEs and medical supplies. Response was extremely challenging due to the ongoing pandemic. The regions are in different levels of quarantine and only essential travels are allowed across provinces. We tapped into local partners in our network's logistical capabilities, including air assets to bring in aid. The private sector response has gone beyond the donation and distribution of relief goods and has also included services like providing trucks and boats and deploying rescue teams to the severely hit areas. We joined the rapid damage assessment and needs analysis for these two events with the Office of Civil Defense and the United Nations, results of which went into the government's response and recovery plans and the UN humanitarian needs and priorities plan. The partnership between the private and public sectors form a crucial part of the national response plan. And it is only through coordinated efforts and a whole of society approach that the country will be able to recover from this recent onslaught of natural calamities in the midst of pandemic. Thank you very much, Visa. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Viron. I, I, I know it has been a very difficult um, year for for the team last year so you've been you've been activated you the the so Veron said mentioned the, the 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 business emergency operation center i recall that it has been activated since the early part of last year because of the taal volcano eruption and for covid alone uh it was activated it was on a prolonged activation since april of last year yes. so it's really amazing job from uh by the team um and then thank you for sharing with us um your insights on, on the previous year as well as the stuff that you're doing um to help the national government and the un so thank you, Veron. Now, let me move now to our second panelist, Mr. Iman Gandhi, who is the vice chair, chairperson of the Indonesian Logistics and Forwarders Association, or ALFI. And uh, Pa Iman has more than 25 years of experience as a professional in, logis in the logistics industry, 
with cross-cultural background working in the top ranks of multinational logistics companies. So his passion really lies in humanitarian logistics and it came across when he started his engagement, the World Food Program back in 2014. So colleagues, please welcome Pa Iman and Pa Iman, if you can tell us a bit about what this Alfie do and also your reflections from how your engagement in, in the National Logistics Cluster. Over to you, Pa Iman. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you for uh, AHA Center as well as uh, CBI for inviting us in this session. Uh, to, to start with, uh, let us introduce about the ALBI as the Association for Logistics and Power Delivery Indonesia. It's an organization established back in 1989 as a form of merger of three transport business associations. Uh, ALBI is also the member of the international uh, association and logistic communities uh, like uh, FIATA, uh, an organization based in, in Switzerland, uh, FAFA for the Asia Pacific for the air freight, uh, as well as for the ASEAN region that we are the member and also the founder of uh, AFA, ASEAN Federation for Forwarder Association. So uh, we've been uh, in place for quite some time. And then uh, as we know that like what has been uh, explained earlier for our, for, from our colleague from Philippines, that uh, although type of disaster might be similar to other countries, but in terms of size, frequency, and density, of course, we are trying to be proud. Indonesia have more track in terms of disaster. Uh, not to mention we have a population which is 300 million population. And, and uh, we have so many cases where uh, humanitarian uh, response is required to be faster and more efficient. And then uh, since the day I, I, I was engaged with the humanitarian organization, I realized that uh, we from the private sector, particularly the logistics service provider, actually can, can contribute and, and take part as an actor in this uh, important uh, event, right? And then uh, we, we, are, we are so very happy to be part of it and we're very proud of it. And not to mention that in Indonesia case, uh, BNPB as the leading sector and the focal point for the disaster management, uh, has established a national logistic uh, cluster uh, for the humanitarian disaster. Right? So it was consists of the uh, many uh, government agencies and as well as the stakeholder and actors, including the private sector. So we have seen that this is a, a tremendous uh, step that we hope that it's going to be a, a good uh, move to make the resilient and strong uh, respond to the humanitarian and disaster in Indonesia. That would be my uh, forward. Uh, Riza, I, I hand it over back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pai Iman. So really, you, you, in terms of capacity, uh, it's, it's really them, right? So it's Alfie having, having the expertise and capacity as well as the resources when it comes to uh, humanitarian logistics. I, I do remember one, uh, a colleague from the industry who also works in humanitarian logistics always reminding me that when you talk about supply chain management and logistics, it's, it's clearly a commercial um, expertise. So with, with Alfie's track record, uh, strong engagement with the BNPB, with, with, the, with the UN, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you'll be able to provide a really good insights in our discussion today. So thank you for joining us, Paiman. Now I move on to our third panelist, who is the deputy head of UN OCHA's Regional Office for Asia in the Pacific, or OCHA ROA, uh, which coordinates emergency preparedness and response in the region. Michelle Saad assists the head of, regional, of the OCHA Regional Office in the unfolding of operations covering 41 countries by working closely with regional and in-country partners on promoting prevention and preparedness while fostering the development of contingency plans aimed at protecting and assisting vulnerable populations. So Mr. Saad has over 15 years of experience managing both humanitarian operations in various field missions such as India, Jordan, Iraq, Ivory Coast, the Western Balkans, Europe, 
Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, Ukraine, and Pakistan. So Michelle, tell us about, we're eager to hear the role of OCHA, ROWAP in, in, in really fostering this kind of engagement with private sector networks such as PDRF and ALFI. And we'd like to know more about your reflections on how we can move this forward. Colleagues, warm welcome, please, for, Ms. for Michelle Saad from OCHA ROWAP. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Riza. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, dear colleagues, my name is Michel Saad. I'm very happy also today to be present here with you. Thanks a lot to the AHA Center also for organizing this. And uh, we were chatting earlier. I understand that it's like a huge participation and a huge event this year, which is also maybe partly thanks to the fact that we can connect from different parts of the world. I'm now stationed in Bangkok, and I'm very happy also to see lots of familiar faces online. So uh, Veronica, uh, also my colleague, Victoria, who's the head of office, uh, UN OCHA office in, in uh, Jakarta, uh, Pak Abdel Malik also, and Pak Iman, very nice to meet you. Um, if you don't put it like very easily uh, to summarize Riza in a few minutes, uh, but as you mentioned, uh, I think yeah, last year we were going, everybody was going about their usual between brackets business. Uh, we had prepared for a few things in, in some countries they know where there is the flood season, the monsoon season, and, and we were working closely. We had like our deadlines, our agendas, our calendars, and then, the, the pandemic started coming from one country to another. And I remember I was in the Philippines with Viron and we were still discussing like, uh, what do you think is gonna happen? And then after one week, uh, we had lockdown in the Philippines and then after also lockdown here in, in Thailand. Uh, I think the very good thing, and this is why this session is super important, is that despite the restrictions on the movement of people, movement of goods continued. And in fact, I think some some uh, like uh, uh, shipping uh, companies uh, have been like doing some some benefits this year. And I'm really happy also to be here because um, the CBI, as you mentioned, Connecting Business Initiative, which was launched at the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016, uh, is one of these like initiatives where we try to rethink the humanitarian uh, <clears throat> panorama and humanitarian. Uh, way of doing things. And I think especially in this region, in Asia Pacific, uh, we have the opportunity, uh, we have the potential to go way beyond uh, what was maybe like initially the ambition in 2000, 2016 or 17. Uh, there's a huge potential in the region. There are like huge platforms, uh, trade connectivities, uh, reach out, outreach to, to population. And I think we're, here, I would really like for us more within the UN uh, United Nations family to be more in the listening mode to our colleagues from the private sector. You know the population much better than we do. These are your people, you know the culture, you know what's accepted, you know what's needed, you know how it should be done. And I think we could learn a lot also from you. We come with our own international experience being deployed in several places, international standards, and then we need your assistance in order to translate this locally. So as you mentioned also, uh, Riza, in the, in the email, uh, we would like, I hope that the session would be like really interactive. Uh, we're here to, you know, like listen to other people, uh, colleagues experience and see how we can learn from each other. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm looking forward for a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. I like what Michelle said or how you emphasize on a listening mode, because I remember, I mean, I came from a private sector network and, and, and even though I'm all gutsy, I tend to be also intimidated whenever there are intercluster coordination meetings with the UN. I'm like, how do we approach this? We know our stuff, but then it seems like we're speaking a different language, right? So, but now that I'm with the CBI, I like how you emphasize that let's let's do this, let's let's rethink and be on a listening mode, particularly for for this session. So at this point, thank you, panelists. We will now have an open discussion. Um, participants are trickling in, and as mentioned earlier, uh, we have a lot of time. We'd like to hear from from the participants if you have questions for our panelists. 
kindly send them in the chat using the chat function and indicate to which speaker you intend to ask your question. Now I'll start now with Veron first for, for the formal discussion. And Veron, based on your reflections on PDRF's response to the major typhoon, so we had Super Typhoon Goni and Typhoon Vamco in the latter part of, I mean, in last year, and the ongoing support of PDRF to the Test, Trace, and Treat Task Force uh, to support the national government in the pandemic response. What do you think were the key success factors that helped PDRF became or to becoming such an active partner of the National Disaster Risk Management Council and the Office of Civil Defense and the humanitarian country team, particularly for logistic support and response? Over to you, Veron. Thank you, Riza. Last year at the, at the onset of the pandemic, we already saw uh, the, the big problem that uh, our country will be facing. And so uh, at a very early stage, the private power network already came together and, and pledged support to the government. And so we are now part of uh, uh, the task force of the government where the private uh, sector uh, working with them, uh, we call it the task, uh, the, the trace, treat and um, uh, test, test, trace, and treat task force. And now our focus is in the rollout of vaccine in our, in our country. However, as the pandemic has been raging on, um, the, the, the season changes. And so uh, we are inundated by the usual, the 20 plus typhoon uh, uh, passing by our country, the earthquakes, the flooding. And so with this pandemic, we had to adjust our response plans and protocols to ensure that we include health risks in the assessment and strictly observe health protocols in our response plans for the safety of our responders and the affected population. And for us to be able to do this, we, we, we did four, we did four uh, uh, plans or activities. Number one is um, we mobilize local partners to limit the number of responders going to avoid going to avoid potentially increasing the spread of the infection going in and around uh, or out of the area. Number two, we activated pre-agreed resources of our network within the region and the province. And then number three, we, uh, we did local procurement of relief goods to minimize logistical requirements. And then fourth and more importantly, we impose strict travel arrangements for our responders, PCR testing prior to travel and another round of testing as well as quarantine upon their return. It, it, it was never easy at that time, but uh, with all, the, all these precautions need to, bu to be put in place so that both the responders and the affected populations uh, are safe and, and um, their needs are attended to uh, without having to compromise their health situation. Thank you, Riza. Thanks a lot, Veron. And uh, so it's interesting what you mentioned about the local procurement of supplies, because remember when we were chatting last week, um, you were also you were also exploring the idea of, of, of having provincial level logistics hubs or warehouses. So probably more on the operational side, like the key ingredients on why PDRF is such an active partner uh, of, of both the NDMO, the NDRIM-C, and at the same time, the Office of Civil Defense and the humanitarian country team. But moving now to Pa Iman, so we've heard during your introductory remarks about the track record, the, your active track record, your long history of being such an active member or partner of the, in the, of the of BNPB through the National Logistics Cluster for Disaster Management. So you already touched on the key ingredients, why it became a really good partnership. But I'd like to challenge you now. Can you please share with us or share with us reflecting on, you know, so what do you think are the gaps that still need to be addressed? What are areas for improvement? I'm pretty sure it's not all rosy, but what are the areas that need to be addressed in order for it to be an enhanced partnership? Over to you, Paiman. Uh, thank you, Riza. I think uh, when you talk about uh, 
humanitarian, uh, humanitarian and caring is are on each other uh, minds of every human being, right? At the, at the cost of system. Uh, so in our case, Indonesia. However, it took hard to, to make a good framework of collaboration uh, to form effective and efficient ways of response in order to bring the highest benefit for the beneficiaries in the nation. Let's say in our case, uh, too many parties involved and less willingness to sharing resources, uh, even in the government side, and then in most cases, until even information, statistics, which are accessible and open for, for crowdsourcing of database, also is a key thing in Indonesia. Uh, last year, I think uh, we recorded nearly 3,000 natural disasters, uh, which any kind of disaster. And then before that, uh, we have a sizable uh, disaster event, such as the occupation in Palu 2018. Uh, landslide and flooding in, in Lombok and an earthquake in Lombok. So it's a critical moment for us. And then it's also a, a good moment at that point of time of the existence of our national logistic cluster in the country, where it was proven since 2018 that the existence is playing a key role. And then uh, the, the good part is, and then the key thing is also, this national logistic cluster is formed by uh, all the stakeholder and actors in the country, not only the government agencies, private sector is there also, the humanitarian, global and local uh, actor is also inside. And then uh, 2020, I think everybody is facing a, a pandemic uh, situation and it's becoming a, a, another sequence actually for us to learn a, a, a critical milestone on how actually the country uh, need to respond the higher scale nor complex disaster which never been uh, faced before, right? And then during the pandemic uh, COVID, actually we the, the logistic cluster has uh, engaged wider uh, uh, actors. And then we managed actually to, to test that the importance of the cooperation among the stakeholder by actually providing the, the faster custom process where RP is contributing and then we identifying the local uh, capacity because the, the identifying the capacity in each provinces where I don't think even any agencies, uh, especially the, the, the international, has this kind of access before. And we're also supporting the warehouse operation. And we, we have seen the better coordination among the stakeholders. So uh, seeing the, these uh, circumstances, I think in some cases, private company and public society tends to do its own kind of caring for humanity program which respond and end up in ineffective uh, response due to improper understanding of aid or nature of supplies required by the by beneficiary or uh, in most cases also offer or, or short of supply, which is also occurred another uh, issue at, at the field, right? And then of course, not to mention it will cost more, more uh, money to spend in the logistics. So, uh, it becoming our, our big problem, and then we have seen it more and more uh, improve from time to time. And then the key factor, uh, the success factor uh, for the 2019-2020, I think the government, in this case, uh, led by BNPB is, uh, BNPB is the focal point of coordinator mandated by law, becoming more welcome and open up for engagement with private sector. I think uh, the leadership of the new chief of the BNPB, uh, the General Monaro, he transformed the structure within the BNPB by establishment of the new director, uh, directorate called the Network Optimization Directorate, where actually it's engaging all the two important uh, in, uh, government agencies in the nation, the BNPB and MOSA, and also uh, engage with many actors of the, the humanitarian. I think uh, the last two years, we have seen the open good communication and coordination of the stakeholder uh, involved of the national logistic cluster establishment. Uh, I hope that, uh, of course, in the future, we need to keep this engagement open 
uh, and getting more uh, wider access, not only for the local actors, but also for the international actors. Uh, and then the most important thing is that how can we actually uh, supported by actual, accurate, uh, real-time information pertaining disaster, uh, like perhaps like a digital base or mobile software operation, because it will enable all stakeholders to move toward the same direction with the effective, efficient approach in logistic, and of course it will accelerate the speed of response and at the same time make the cost effective for uh, distributing the, the relief and aid to the beneficiaries. Uh, that will be my uh, response, uh, Rija. I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pai Iman. So from the structural uh, changes in, in, in having that directorate in BNPB, and then you, you, you've, you also mentioned uh, the cost effectiveness and or, or basically also having a common or shared understanding of how do we do this from a logistic service provider point of view, from an NDMO point of view, and also from a UN point of view. So it, it adds value to everyone who's engaging in humanitarian logistics, particularly when we talk about effectiveness, efficiency, and at the same time scale. So really good point coming from a logistic service provider. But now I move on to the UN point of view. From a regional perspective, I'd like to ask Michelle if, uh, in the context of ASEAN UN interoperability on response coordination, how do you think can we further enable the engagement of private sector networks such as PDRF and ALFI, both at the country and regional level disaster management mechanisms? So the timing is now. I mean, we hear these mature networks. We we hear about their engagement. But what do you think are the priority areas that we should now focus on and the pain points? I'd also like to hear from you the pain points that we need to address for this to be a multi-stakeholder engagement. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, with, the, with the AHA Center specifically, we have uh, like a very tight collaboration. And in fact, you know, like, um, I mean, pre uh, having like cases of COVID, let's say in Jakarta and in Indonesia, we were in quite in contact. And then like, since both countries went on lockdown, I would say then we were like, we intensified these uh, discussions. Um, also before that, I had the chance to have a short mission in, uh, in Indonesia. And I met like, you know, with my colleagues there, I know also like about the great work that's been done there. I mean, it's, it's one of the very few countries where we have what like, we call national clusters, you know, it, it, it's like, it's, it's very, very inspiring for other contexts. Uh, I think there's a will from all sides you know, to strengthen all of this, to have like um, uh, cross fertilization, sharing experience and knowledge. Uh, and I think we need maybe like to start uh, considering like maybe a few quick wins, you know, how can we do like maybe some small steps in order to start, you know, advancing more on this and that. I think with the PDRF colleagues, um, uh, we can really have them, uh, you know, maybe discussing with other colleagues in other countries and sharing their experience and seeing how they could, you know, uh, support these other colleagues in a different country, maybe like build a similar network, you know, like we have in the Philippines. In Indonesia also, I think now having like also Pak Iman with us on, online, I think after that we can engage further in like more I would say detailed uh, or, or like discussions to see how we can, you know, like shape something. It doesn't have to necessarily be like something we have in different countries, but it we, it can get inspired from that. So I think there's uh, appetite, there's willingness. And I, as I said earlier, there's a huge potential in the region. I, I, I really believe so. And, and we just have to start advancing, like taking some baby steps. I think at the end, you asked me for these, like maybe pain points. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. I think sometimes we might be trying to communicate the same thing, except I am using my own technology and somebody in front of me is using their, their like vocabulary terminology. And, and we're trying to say the same thing, but we're saying it in a different way. 
So I think one initial thing would be to sort of do like uh, this two-way education, whereby instead of us coming and saying, uh, there is this connecting business initiative to try to explain what we mean by connecting business initiative, uh, like concretely, when we say, as you said, this intercoordination cluster uh, meeting, what do we mean by intercoordination cluster meeting? I mean, uh, for, for some people, for example, especially after hearing all these uh, COVID infection clusters, maybe this word is not very nice to, to hear. So I, I think we also need from our side to come and, and try to simplify the terminology, try to say what we're trying exactly to achieve, and then be open to see how we can get there together. It's a negotiation at the end. It's a partnership. Uh, we cannot have it only this way or that way. We have to meet somewhere in between. And, and uh, I, I really welcome, you know, any, uh, how to say, request for more information. And I think we can also learn a lot from the private sector, how we can, you know, maybe sometimes uh, simplify the information and, and find other means of, of uh, sharing it. I hope I answered your question. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you for really emphasizing cross-fertilization, cross-learning, because I remember during our earlier talks, particularly with Pa Iman, he was also asking about, uh, it's, it's really, this, there, we had initial discussions on how do we now do capacity building for their members, because they're the logistics service provider with such a massive reach all over the country. And then, of course, when we talk about capacity building, it's, it's what you, like what you said, how do we now meet between, right? So, so compromise the language that PDRF, ALFI, private sector uses, the language that the UN uses, the language that the NDMOs use. But thank you, Michelle. But mindful of time and participants, if you do have questions, feel free to use the chat function. I'm pretty sure you have questions for the for, for our panelists today. Don't be shy, feel free to share with them. But mindful of time, I'd like to uh, spend the last portion of our discussion now asking first Veron and then Pa Iman. Veron, I mean, PDRF, has had a very, very long journey with the NDMO, with the Council, the National Disaster Risk Management Council. You were part of uh, the logistics cluster uh, of for Oplan Roli last year. But um, now, because we're saying that this is the first time that uh, at least we now have a platform where private sector, AHA Center, the UN, is engaging one another and it's actually an opportune time because we have a new admir work program i want you to focus current gaps your wish list from our colleagues from the ndmos and the un when it comes to for example standby arrangements or pre-positioning agreements and i'll ask the same question to pa iman as well wish list your aspirations over to you veron Thank you for that question, Riza, very important. You know, to ensure agility in response, uh, we do have standby and pre-positioning agreements with our uh, member companies and partners. And uh, we mobilize these, these agreements, not only to directly um, deliver aid to communities, but to enable other actors respond as well. And that includes the government and the UN. Humanitarian logistics is a critical response capability of PDRF that we continue to strengthen. And um, one, my first wish list, and, and I, I thank this conference, and I thank that we have been invited to this conference, um, is what this conference has brought to fore an important discussion in the matter of humanitarian logistics at the regional level. I will definitely be calling Paiman and Michelle after this session, because uh, this, this actually uh, brought to the table important discussion on humanitarian logistics. The world has gotten smaller, especially with this pandemic. And uh, we see that uh, we do have a lot of resources that we can tap, not only within the country, but also at the regional level. 
and, and I'm happy to note that um, the kind of uh, logistical support that we are also um, uh, providing in our country can also now be uh, extended outside, either um, in a way of uh, uh, pre-agreements um, and also sharing, sharing of resources. Uh, another another um, aspect of, um, and, and this one I would like to share with the rest uh, of, uh, with the similar platform that are listening here. Uh, I, I'd like to thank CBI for the uh, technical uh, support that they have um, extended to us uh, throughout these years, uh, which has um, definitely uh, strengthened our platform. And uh, uh, we, we, there are, uh, there is an important uh, call for a private sector to be engaged, especially in countries like PDRF, uh, in, in Philippines, or Indonesia, and Bangkok, where we are inundated by a lot of um, um, emergencies. And um, this is high time uh, to have this kind of discussion, not only in strengthening the role of the private sector at the country level, but also at the regional level, and be interoperable and discussing in the same language with that of the UN and with that of the government. Thank you, Lisa. Same language. So protocols. And, and, and really, remember, so when we had the poll activity a while ago, most of the participants said that, yeah, training and simulation exercises. But then before we do those, we need to agree on a common language, yeah. or even a common language is actually um, possible. But same question to Paiman as well. Paiman, because you have like, remind us again how many members you have around all around the country. And you ask the voice of the logistics service providers, those small businesses, what are your wish lists and what are your members' wish lists when it comes to improving this relationship in terms of humanitarian logistics? Over to you, Paiman. Thank you, Lisa. So private sector do care because they are part of the nation, right? So then, then so we have limitation in this case, like what Alfie has as a member. We remain stand with the country and the official and as well as the international communities to build strong and resilient response to the humanitarian Indonesia. I give you an example. During the pandemic, more than 40% of the import export uh, volume was dropped, right? And you can imagine how suffering the, the logistics service provider throughout the times, but it doesn't stop them actually to want to take part uh, in the sharing and carrying the, the victim of the disaster. We have, uh, I would like to say that uh, start utilizing our massive capacity in, in the country. We are present in the 33 provinces nationwide. We form more than 3,000 member companies, ranging from the, from the small medium enterprise up to the uh, multinational companies. And then uh, we, you can, we can use this capacity to support uh, the local government as a start, as well as the international communities to to respond the humanitarian operation in the form of uh, our logistic capacity resources. We can, we can support with the manpower, the, our asset like truck, warehouses, and also our know-how. We do have a know-how, uh, uh, which is nailed down to the local uh, segment. Because, you know, because we are, we are a big, big nation apart by islands, right? And sometimes there's a local uh, practices that not the same, let's say, with other uh, provinces. And then our member in those provinces knew best how actually to treat and respond uh, with the uh, stakeholder within the uh, response area. And, and we were also invited actually, how can we uh, have a platform to share the, the know-how and manpower in support 24-hour uh, operation, right? Because uh, now perhaps it's only happening in the, uh, the international uh, uh, humanitarian agencies, or let's say uh, the, the UN uh, agencies and the government. But how can we have this kind of 24-hour operation task force that can be activated uh, 24 hours? And, and we do have the capacity on that. We do have the experience in running the commercial operation. 
it's just uh, how to uh, tweak from the commercial becoming humanitarian because in principle the way we operate is the same right and we have the the, the capacity we have the database and knowledge of this so i'm hoping that more and more uh, agencies and government who can see it as uh, as a capacity that they, they can hop on and utilize and then we are looking forward to to work together with any agencies as long as we can bring uh, value uh, to to the to the beneficiaries in indonesia then we, we should be available for further discussion thank you visa i like you know whenever pa iman uh, uh, speaks it's like we care right so bottom line is we care we just need to make sure that there's a common you know the common language and a more orderly platform wherein we can plug in but the bottom line is we care the private sector network the private sector cares really really inspiring now i have a question for uh michelle and this is from a participant and uh so the question is, can you share a good example of coordination or practice between so the government, so with with the with the with their cluster system and the UN and 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 probably let's let's see. So we kept on talking about engaging the private sector here. So how do how does now private sector plug into the coordination mechanisms between the government and the UN and 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 then you have the private sector networks like in the Philippines and Indonesia over to you Michelle thank you uh, I mean I cannot really uh, I would leave for PDRF uh, Veronica to to like share their experience uh, but like if we want to discuss a bit about the Philippines so uh, the PDRF sits on these coordination meetings uh, HCT with other UN agencies international NGOs local NGOs and and uh, donors sometimes sometimes government representatives uh, this is one model let's say in other countries, uh, we have like different smaller coordination forums, you know, with the CBI network, like we have within Vanuatu, for example, in the Pacific, there's a very strong network. Uh, before coming back here to Bangkok, I stayed like six, seven months in Pakistan. And actually I went there like soon after the floods in uh, Sindh province in the south. And um, so there, for example, the, the like, uh, in at the governorate level let's say uh, the chief commissioner took the initiative of holding like uh, regular meetings with the big private sector company heads and i thought this was like a very good you know initiative you know to see how they can do in terms of like you know covid response ppes and responding to the flood so what we try to do uh, we started, you know, like asking some other UN agencies and lots of our colleagues, especially from UNDP development program, uh, they had like lots of engagement with the private sector, you know, in terms of the sustainable development goals, SDGs and whatnot. So instead of reinventing the wheel, I tried first to explain in house, let's say with the, within the UN. Uh, what we mean by CBI and like whether we can integrate, you know, the private sector into preparedness, mitigation and response. And then we started like some, uh, I would say, modest engagement with like some uh, some of the private sector uh, 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 stakeholders. And but like we had also, I would say, similarly to what we were hearing from uh, Pak Iman, you know, I mean, we were not trying to preach uh, some, we were not trying to preach otherwise, uh, they were like convinced that, you know, like investing in preparedness, mitigation and response for their own communities is actually something of benefit also to the private sector. You cannot run a business somewhere where like people are, don't have houses, don't have money uh, and, and cannot look forward. On the contrary, if these people are more or less they have the basic means and they, even more then you, you your business will also thrive as also the, the, the community will be benefiting so um I, I think there is no let's not maybe focus on one uh, size fits all it depends on each context but ideally i think uh, if we can have some like uh, networks within some countries and then like to have these networks at least present during 
a few meetings with the other UN agencies, but here even more important with local NGOs and international NGOs and the government, uh, I think this would be like really successful. You need this form of dialogue to understand position and to see how we can all move forward. Opening the doors, I like that, right? And at the same time, uh, Michelle, idea on having other networks, other private sector stakeholders or partners observing how networks or existing private sector networks are doing this, that's that's really valuable. That's why, I mean, it's, it's whenever we also have meetings with potential private sector partners of, of CBI, we always say that the best way to help them understand the different models and mechanisms and structure is really hearing it from the existing CBI networks, opening the doors, making them an active partner in these discussions. But colleagues, mindful that we only have two more minutes left and I'm gonna connect this last uh, session or last segment of our discussion with a question from the participant. Now we've talked a lot about national level kind of engagement. But I'd like, let's close this discussion by, by hearing from you your concrete calls to action, starting with Veron, Paiman, and then Michelle, on how can we now increase or enhance our capacity when it comes to supporting one ASEAN, one response at the regional level in the event of a large scale disaster event. Very brief, concrete calls to action. Veron, Paiman, and then Michelle. Thank you, thank you, Riza. Um, I'd like to credit first within the country. I'd like to credit uh, the government uh, for giving us the platform uh, to a mechanism for the private sector to be involved in our DRR, not only during response, but in in the preparedness and planning. And we are involved in all those activities with them. And we, I also credit uh, the UN for all the technical support such that we were able uh, to, to have this, um, eg uh, not expertise, but experience in uh, collaborating at the regional level. Uh, as, as mentioned a while ago, we are uh, very much willing uh, to go into partnership. We already have an existing partnership with AHA Center, and we'd like to see that uh, more in, in uh, concrete terms, especially in humanitarian logistics. In this COVID response, uh, our uh, PDRF and the other private sector network have been helping the government uh, in its, uh, in its uh, vaccine uh, rollout, in the supply chain, and in um, formulating guidelines uh, in how we, uh, we uh, fight this pandemic. So I think uh, this little experience that we have uh, we are very much willing uh, to discuss this at the regional level. Thank you. Thanks, Viron. Paiman, concrete call to action, very briefly. Yeah, thank you, Riza. Uh, I think our success story in Indonesia can be duplicated uh, all over the ASEAN, right? Uh, mainly because uh, even ALPI is the member of AFA. AFA is the entity associated to the ASEAN, same like AHA Center, right? So actually, how can we spread out uh, our, our success story in Indonesia to other nine countries in ASEAN? And, and we have the platform, of course, with the support from the international agencies, as well as the success story also in Philippines, can engage with our uh, one of our colleagues from the Logistic Association in, in the Philippines to take part uh, in how uh, uh, DRR in, in Philippines and also other countries uh, all over ASEAN. So I think that's an avenue that we can we can uh, explore further with the support from the AHA Center, uh, of course with other uh, agencies, UN agencies as well, and see how can we uh, spread out this uh, wider and to respond the bigger uh, DRR in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Iman, and over to you, Michelle. I know you've already talked a bit about what you want is concrete calls to action, but in support of having a multi-stakeholder, one ASEAN, one response with ASEAN, UN interoperability, plus the private sector, briefly, your call to action. Thank you. I, I mean, I think to complement what the colleagues mentioned, I think uh, 
luckily movement of goods continued you know despite the pandemic restrictions but i think this needs to go into a legal framework i think we need to have a proper legal framework where we say uh, humanitarian assistance should be allowed despite restriction x y z humanitarian workers also should be allowed access to those who are in need during difficult times i would say one on on the legal framework two uh, if we can achieve some form of a common digitization you know because some countries they still in order to have like shipment receipts or customs frame uh, like customs uh, work or something they still need paper document and with covid i mean we now have to move more into you know digital platforms so if we can have a common digitized like trade and, and customs agreement this will be really good and then Pak Iman also mentioned it earlier and Veronica also mentioned it uh, we have to think local act global but also think local I don't know how to say that both so it's not enough to have maybe like uh, uh, to, to have like you know your value chain from x y or z but to try to see how you can develop local capacity either to have some form of a contingency stock there or in order to know like you have some form of uh, like uh, first material and how you can complement it thank you very much for the opportunity thank you michelle Ak local but think global absolutely and you know with the new admir work program for 2021 2025 we now have clear directions on increasing the multi-hazard resilience of the private sector supply chain of vital industries participants thank you for your active engagement as well i hope this session together with our expert panelists has been a source of enlightenment on how we can advance these partnerships as part of the whole of society approach and at the same time, a more multi-stakeholder, one ASEAN, one response approach. Once again, allow me to extend my gratitude to our panelists, Veron, Paiman, and Michelle for an insightful discussion. And before we end, I believe we owe AHA Center a photo op uh before we close this so how do we do this ilham so shall we ask participants to kindly turn on your video uh huh and then uh we're gonna have just a photo opportunity so that this will be included in the report that we will be submitting together with recommendations from alfi from pdrf from ocha uh as well all right. Let's wait. There you go. Thank go you. ahead, Ilan. So uh, the camera on your laptop or devices is now turned on. Please turn on your camera so we will be having a photo together. We are still waiting for others to come. Okay. Please wait a minute. We still have four people who are not yet turning on the camera. We'll wait for uh, two minutes, maybe. All right. So I will be counting from three to one, and then we will be having a two shot of photos. So the first one is take your comfortable positions. And the second with using this one, one ASEAN, one response. So good for the first one. Okay, go with your comfortable positions. All right. Within three, two, one. Here you go. Okay, one more time with one ASEAN one response. Can you please all together using this one ASEAN one response? Okay. Within three two, one. All right. Thank you so much, Riza, and all the panelists today. The floor is yours. Thank you, participants. Do take care. Paiman, Veron, Michelle, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care.